know. Uh, it'll be recording if they want to share or not, because I know many people are going to want to see this who cannot join the call now. Um, and we're going to start right on time to make sure we can actualize our time here. Before I introduce our speaker today, um, I want to just contextualize a little bit of what we're doing here. Um, that um, we believe at Uri Litzedek that there is a, pro a, race, a racism problem in the Orthodox community. Um, I, uh, I'm sure we all have anecdotes of that. I mean, just one of many. I remember davening. I was davening in shul, and the guy next to me is talking about the Schwarz on the White House, you know, the Obama era. Literally, I'm davening. I, you know, we were even saying, um, um, <laughs> Kel Rachum Vachanu. We're talking about God's compassionate uh, traits. So, you know, we can all share things. And we are not saying that the Orthodox world is the only place there's racism in the world. Of course, that would be absurd. But what we're saying is that those of us who are t are work to take responsibility for orthodoxy um, see this as our mess to address. And so it's very complicated. And so our goal in these webinars are to, are to uh, learn from experts in the field um, who, um, um, who can uh, help us think through this, help us think th through the nature of the problem, help us think through ways each of us can feel empowered in real time to respond to uh, racist discourse, racist behavior, uh, structural problems we see um, and um, uh, in real time, to do the work of uprooting the racism that still exists within ourselves, of course, that's spiritual work, and, um, and then ultimately to, to, to think even more broadly about how collectively we can, we can take this on. And so the first thing you can do as an ally is sign on to our new pledge that you are someone that when you witness such activities and you feel safe to do so, um, always good to feel safe as an ally, uh, but also willing to take risks, um, are able to intervene. Um, secondly, that you sign up for these webinars and help us plug others into them. Um, and thirdly, that we want to be uh, going into communities with our educators um, to, to be addressing this problem. Um, of course, it's an intersectional problem. With, um, please be on mute if you're not currently speaking, uh, with issues of race, issues of gender, issues of sexuality, xenophobia. But in this context, we're, um, we're, we're uh, really looking at racism. So any, uh, any questions on the campaign before we move forward here, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question, or you could probably type it in the chat also. Um, great, okay. Great. So um, for our first session here, and I want to give a shout out to Donnie Satlow. Donnie, are you here? Let's see, I can't see exactly who's here. I'm sure he's here somewhere. Oh, there he is. Okay, Donnie, so thank you for helping, helping uh, set this up. Um, and, uh, and to our partners here, AJ and Eddie, um, and, uh, and to all you who have, are tapping in. Uh, in addition to the presentation, there'll be the chance to engage with one another um, uh, uh, around, around this issue. And if you have other ideas of ways that we can take this, uh, this campaign more robustly into the community, uh, we hope you'll do so. Uh, and beyond, of course. Okay, Rabbi Shays Rishon is a Brooklyn-based African-American Orthodox Jewish author, blogger, graphic artist, and public speaker, a social activist more by chance than choice. Manish Tana entered the blogosphere in 2009 with a mission to nurture unity and strengthen multifaceted identity within the Jew of color or JOC uh, community. Rabbi Rishon was included on the Jewish Weeks 36 under 36, list for 2014 and has had speaking engagements in places such as Boston University, the University of Kentucky, and the Eliezer Society at Yale University. In 2010, Manish Tana launched the first online dating site catering to Jews of color, Mosaic Matches. In 2014, he founded the multicultural, multi multiculturally Jewish online magazine, JN Magazine. His books include Thoughts from a Unicorn, 100% Black, 100% Jewish, 0% safe. Fine, thanks, how are you Jewish? A stream of consciousness, stroll through the Jew of color mind. 
and, and the Rishoni illuminated legacy Haggadah. Rabbi Rishon, thank you for taking this time to study uh, with us uh, and to teach. Thank you for having me. I'm going to pa pass, pass the floor over to you. Okay. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, uh, it's good to be here. I'm glad to see that uh, such an initiative is uh, being taken and that, you know, clergy is taking such um, an interest in seeing it as a problem that needs to be addressed and solved. Because it's one thing for like individuals or lay people to do it, but to have this sort of top-down approach is uh, very useful and heartening. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, do you want to launch? You okay? Do you want to launch into your presentation? Um, sure. Where exactly do we want to start or, or move in? I find it uh, very helpful to have maybe a framing question or intention before uh, moving into the various topics we can move into. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Great. So. Um, Perhaps you want to share first um, a little bit about um, your own sense of uh, where we're experiencing progress and, um, and where the challenges um, are becoming even more acute um, for people of color in, in the Orthodox community. Um, and maybe you want to share a little bit of your narrative uh, in that context as well. So a little bit about, I guess, me. I grew up Chabad, and as I like to joke, I got better. Um, in the um, late 80s, early 90s, I lived in and around Crown Heights during before and after the riots. Um, so I had a very unique perspective onto those sort of issues and uh, interactions as someone on sort of both sides and in the in crowd of either one. Um, and I moved on, I guess, as was said before, sort of accidentally into this space of really trying to create a common dialogue around issues of race or the particular challenges and experiences uh, of Jews of color. And I think this is a very interesting moment now, uh, interesting and sort of frustrating, uh, particularly given the backdrop of increased uh, anti-Semitic attacks, or the flares are happening particularly in New York and Brooklyn. And uh, one just in general, one of the things that first needs to be addressed is when we're talking about uh, racism or very specifically uh, interactions between the black and Jewish communities, we have to realize that with that statement, we've sort of tacked on two invisible parentheticals that don't really get addressed. When we generally tend to speak about black Jewish relations or the black relations between the black and Jewish communities, invisibly we're talking about communal relations between non-Jewish black and white Jewish communities. It's removing from that conversation interactions between white Jewish and black Jewish communities it's removing from that conversation interactions between non-Jewish black, Jewish black communities. And without having that sort of full picture, um, the full solution to these sort of problems will never really be addressed because we're not even dealing with all the full puzzle pieces. Um, and the discussion of race and Judaism, particularly even moving towards issues of racism in orthodoxy, uh, there's sort of this, again, with the increase of attacks, this sort of panic around uh, quote unquote black anti Semitism and how to deal with it. And there's a lack of conversation and realization of how much race plays into those conflicts because. One, white anti-Semitism and black anti-Semitism, while they might manifest in the same way, are two different creatures. But they both come from the same premise of this fallacy of Jews equaling white. So for white anti-Semitism, removing sort of the religious Christ killer sort of narrative and ideology, white anti-Semitism is based on this concept that Jews are white and they're able 
or attempting to infiltrate real white people and infiltrate uh, places of government, um, uh, social strata, places of wealth. Uh, black anti-Semitism is also coming from the premise of Jews being white. And so for black anti-Semitism, it's just Jews are another form of white people that are uh, engaging in the same structures and amplifying the same uh, machinations of white supremacy and discrimination and et cetera. And so it's very important for Jews of color and particularly African-American or Caribbean-American descended Jews to be part of these conversations and for our sort of take to be not only listened to, but sought after in the first place. Um, I was speaking a few weeks ago uh, in New Jersey for Dr. Martin Luther King Day, where I noted that it's very few Jewish organizations that have the higher you go up in their ranks where there are people, Jews of color there, and there are very few African-American organizations or institutions that have African-American Jews as part of their table to talk about these things. Um, so again, without those two things sort of happening at the same time and everybody in the room being here for that conversation, we're not really going to be able to progress. That's just going to be my opening salvo, I guess, and I'm looking to okay great yeah that was super helpful thank you so um into when it, when someone uh realizes the problem that everyone is white on the board for example or white on the staff and so they specifically work to hire um how do they how do they avoid tokenizing um they, they want to be sure to have representation but um but they don't want to put that person on the spot be like, well, you're the one black person here, and so want to, you know, can you educate us? They want to be helpful, but also want to, um, you know, not tokenize. How how can boards and staffs navigate that? Where in some cases they have more, uh, you know, uh, less less um, of a pool to pick from. Let's say there's only one or two people of color in their community, so they want to make sure to have them in the conversation, but also to make have them really feel welcome. <clears throat> Well, it's more than just having the people there in the room. You, again, have to, one, listen to their input, and uh, two, seek it out. And when it comes to organizations, uh, there is a very low retention rate, even for uh, diverse boards, of the same Jew of color being there for a length of time. It's usually like a rotating door. And this is usually because there aren't structures in place within the organization to help support that person that's in that sort of tokenized seat. And that's how it usually leads to tokenism. It's just, oh, we have this spot, we'll put somebody of color there in this chair, but not create the tools for that person there to then succeed or grow or thrive in it and to invite more people in. The, when you have a board where there's maybe one or two Jews of color, that means that the person there doesn't feel comfortable in saying to other Jews of color, hey, come join this organization. They are really opening, they're really welcoming, they're here to listen. It's usually somebody there just hacking away at the weeds and they're there usually just to be visible to other Jews of color or to other mainstream Jews to say, yes, we do exist, but they're not necessarily enjoying the work or feeling welcome there, but more feeling tolerated. And there's a, that's a huge sort of misconception with a lot of Jewish congregations, organizations, where they'll say, oh, we have, you know, this person or this family and they're this ethnicity and they're welcomed. Are they welcomed or are they tolerated? Just because you're not actively saying something negative to them doesn't mean you're welcoming them. Yeah. Unless you're interacting with them in the same way that you would interact with someone else that isn't that, then you're not really welcoming them. And then there's that, then sort of the pushback happens. Like I had a conversation a few years ago where it was a rabbi of a congregation and there was a Hispanic family that just moved into the neighborhood was tending the shul. And he was asking for advice as to how to navigate. Like when I like greet them, should I, and he rattle off like some Spanish phrase, said, no, don't do that, that's weird and creepy. Or should I do this? And some other sort of Hispanic themes, like don't do that either. That's just weirdly like patronizing. And so they asked, well, what should I say? I said, 
Shabbat Shalom. Because like, they're also just Jews. It doesn't mean like throwing on a sombrero and like playing maracas every time they walk into the room. But it does mean being aware of, oh, we have this Jewish calendar. What Jewish holidays or uh, events are happening with this community? Let's bring that in. What kinds of foods, what kind of customs, what kind of, you know, the other parts of the flavor. It's not about welcoming can oftentimes turn into a weird fetish, fetishization, fetishization, Ugh. Um, where it's not about emphasizing the difference of the person in the congregation. It's being open to the difference and recognizing that there is a difference. That doesn't mean making it, making that person the sum total of their difference. And it often seems like an, uh, an inter insurmountable task when like I speak with organizations or individuals where it's like, well, how do we ensure this? How do we ensure that? Like, I'm not sure of this experience. I've never had this experience. And I'd like to push back and challenge that in the way that we've all had that experience. We've all felt the uncomfortability of being the only Jew in a space. We've all felt the uncomfortability of being in high school and being the ugly ducky, duckling or not the jock or walking to the room, I'm the shortest person here or the oldest person here or I'm the, the youngest person here, I don't feel comfortable. With. So it's taking that same pit of uncomfortability, unfamiliarity, that same blindness that the people that aren't you have towards the situations that you're in and really just turning it back. Well, how, what would make you feel welcome in that space? Do that. How would you feel that you're a part of this community? Do that. Like, for a second, sort of remove the specific difference and address, well, how would you have appreciated people addressing your difference if you were in this scenario in this kind of space? Great, great. So take, um, taking a step back, if we may, um, because in these, in these early webinars, we're trying to really understand what's happening. Um, uh, I, I guess there's a kind of a few parts qu questions here, but basically, um, um, is there a racism problem in orthodoxy, right? Is it, as they say, a, a few bad apples, or do you think it's something more pervasive? And what is the nature of that? Is there anything unique to, to racism within orthodoxy that might be look different than just racism in America in general? Are there texts or halakhot or cultural um, uh, cultural structures in place that um, that enhance or enable that racism even even further? And what like how is it most being manifest today for Jews of color who are who are either identify as Orthodox or come in and out of the Orthodox community? That is a very multi-layered question. Sure. <laughs> um, and it's, it's not necessarily as cut and dry, where the easy answer would be to say there's a textual basis, but there's a difference in a lot of cases of what the text actually says and what later translations have interpreted. For example, if we look at, you know, the Curse of Ham, one that's an entire miasma of, of conflicting interpretations and translations. But to take one example, if we look at um, Me'am Loez in Torah Anthology, when in Parsha Noah, he's talking about the curses that were visited upon Cham. And he says that Cham's uh, lips were turned thick and gross like those of a Negro, his eyes turned red, and his hair became kinky. And he's quoting Tanhuma, except that Tanhuma doesn't say that. Tanhuma says that Cham's hair was singed and his lips became loose, which is very different from that. Uh, if you look at uh, the Midrash says, it says that uh, Ham's children were cursed to be uh, black forever. And it quotes, um, it's falling out of my head right now. It's quoting a Talmud. But the Talmud, again, doesn't say that. The only instance of race comes from Rashi's translation later when he says that cursing 
is reference to uh, Kush, who is dark. And then there's also sort of the selective use of texts, where uh, Perke de Rebbe Eliezer is like, that's where the text of Kedusha comes from in Amida, the Kadosh, 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 and all those things. But very few people like read chapter 24 of Perke de Rebbe Eliezer when it's talking about Ham and his sons and describes them uh, as it goes, as I'm recalling from memory, uh, and Hashem blessed Noach and his sons, and he blessed uh, Ham to be black like the raven. He blessed Shem and his sons to be black and comely. He blessed Yafet and his sons to be white and beautiful. So firstly, when it comes to blackness and Ham, one, it describes it as a blessing, not a curse. Two, when it comes to Shem, who Abraham is descended from, and thus Jews are descended from, it describes him as being black and comely. Yet that's not ever a, you know, thing that's brought into commentary, which is very interesting because a lot of commentaries rely on Perky and Rebbe Eliezer. The opinion that um, Zipporah wasn't actually uh, Kushite, she was from Midian. That commentary comes down from Perkei Drebeliezer, which from that context of chapter 24, it doesn't matter what color she is, because according to him, everyone in that area was whatever varying kind of black, whether like the raven or comely. Uh, the opinion that uh, Yosef, when he married uh, Osnat, that Osnat wasn't actually Potiphar's daughter, but Dina's daughter from Shechem, Again, that wouldn't matter in what color they were because you already established that everyone in that region was that sort of same color. So there's this creative sort of use that seems to be textual, but whatever the original source says isn't ever looked at. It's read through the commentary of somebody that commented on that or translated that. And the rest of the context isn't ever looked at of the sources that are being brought down. And so it's, extremely interesting. Um, Rashi does this thing where, again, he brings down Tanhuma when uh, Abraham and Sarah, when they're first going down to Egypt, where his commentary is that Abraham says to Sarah, um, say that you're my sister because, behold, we're going down to a land whose inhabitants are dark and ugly, and I see now that you're white and beautiful, so, and they'll kill me if, you know, they think we're together, so say you're my sister. But again, the Tanhuma doesn't say that. It says that Abraham says to Sarah, we're going down to a land that's dark and ugly. There's no mention of white and whiteness and beauty. And again, he's saying that the land, like the, the spiritual quality of the place is ugly and sort of dark in that connotation. Because I believe it's uh, the Ramban that brings down, well, if both the Philistine and the Mitzrayim were familiarly connected, why didn't Abraham say the same thing when he went to the Philistines? Why didn't he say, oh, we're going down to a land that's where the people are this? Because they looked the same. The difference was that there was different quality of spirituality there. We see that when Alfie Melech was able to figure out, well, hey, something's not right here. I'm not gonna just like grab up Sarah and take her like to be my wife. Let me figure out what's happening here. Because the people there were of a different quality. So the land was of a different quality. It wasn't a connotation of what their skin color or appearance was. So there's not really a textual base, objectively. It's a textual basis that's been filtered through a certain kind of Jewish community that looked a certain kind of way. And so it's looked through a lens of things that made sense to them, as opposed to a conception of what world jewelry looks like. So some have suggested, thank you for that. Some have suggested that um, over the last three year, last few years during the Trump administration, um, that with the, with the high numbers of Orthodox Jews in America who are in support of uh, the, the administration and the policies um, has enabled and allowed a, a form of white supremacy uh, to enter uh, into Orthodox circles, which were more foreign before. 
um, and and um, has radicalized some who held such uh, such uh, white nationalist type views, um, uh, or um, and emboldened them more deeply. And I wonder your view on that. Um, uh, have you seen a change over the last few years within uh, within the Orthodox community? And if so, what do you attribute that to? I don't think I've particularly seen a change. I just see people feeling more emboldened to say the things that they've always been saying. Like for me, when I've seen uh, reports of anti-Semitic attacks on Orthodox communities, one, there's always a marked difference between what the attacker, the race of the attacker is. For example, either it's, you know, uh, mugger attacks, you know, Jewish boys in Crown Heights, as opposed to black mugger stopped in Crown Heights attacking boys. Those headline language choices have never changed. Uh, the commentary that happens in these articles or across social media hasn't ever changed because uh, it always devolves into a, oh, these people are animals. Or um, one particularly charming comment that I saw was uh, Makas Hoshech strikes again. Uh, these aren't new ideologies that just sprung up. Um, they're part of some communities and where it, it's kind of thought as to be okay. Um, I could tell you that from growing up in Crown Heights and the attitudes and altercations that I and other African-American Jews that lived in Crown Heights as Chabad Jews in Crown Heights in the 80s experienced. So it's, it's not really uh, a new thing that's being integrated. It's not even new in the Jewish context. If you look at uh, the 1820 Constitution, Rule Number 23 of Congregation Kahal Kadosh in Charleston, South Carolina, which is the first shul in South Carolina, that rule says uh, this congregation shall not accept any proselytes unless there is a letter from a previous consistory or rabbi, and provided that he share they are not people of color. Um, 1828, Shire Chesed, New Orleans, uh, before the city council, uh, that congregation was declared as being a congregation for the white Israelites of the city. So even looking before the GI Bill, where there's sort of this conception of that's when Jews sort of became white, there was already that self-identification and that othering of Jews of color even then, in the early 19th century. So these aren't new things. Great, great. So, you know, many are looking for guidance on um, white Jews in America who for, feel more vul uh, vulnerable amidst in, in, rising anti-Semitism, um, feel, uh, often feel that other minorities should accept us at the table as, as a fellow vulnerable minority. Um, hey, I'm a white Jew and Jews are under attack and you're Latino and you're black, and whatever the case is, seat at the table and find themselves sometimes surprised um, when um, their vulnerability is explicitly or implicitly um, questioned. Um, and for ways that might be understandable that a white Jew can hide their Jewishness, a person of color, of course, can't hide their skin color. Um, you can't just take that off. Um, and and um, if you look at socioeconomic demographics and, and other factors of white Jews in America in comparison, uh, it, it, it is something different. But none of us will deny the threat uh, to Jews, as we've seen violently over the last few years, is real. So how might white Jews um, humbly but also boldly uh, be, be, serve as allies with other minorities? Um, what sensitivities do you think uh, they can bring into that space um, and, and yet do that with authenticity? Another easy question. <laughs> um, firstly, it has to come down to the realization and acknowledgement of 
race in Judaism and whiteness. I think a lot of the barrier um, when people hear things like white Jews or like white Jews are white is a value judgment being attached where there isn't. It's just an objectively, phenotypically observable thing. It doesn't make any less sense for white Jews to be claimed as white than it makes any less sense for me to say that I'm black. Like, if I said to you right now, I'm not black, I'm black passing, that wouldn't really make any sense. You'd be like, okay. Um, and with that realization, we can then move to the realization that whiteness is a spectrum. Um, again, a lot of pushback when it comes to conversations of Jews and whiteness and white privilege is like, I don't have white privilege because, you know, there's the Klan or there's a this or there's a that. Um, so an analogy that I like to say sometimes is like, that's almost equivalent to someone with one eye saying, I can't see because people with two eyes say I can't see, but they're talking to people who have no eyes. So when it comes to white privilege or the fullness of white privilege or provisional white privilege, which are all the things get tossed around, there's only one class of people in America who have sort of full white privilege, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, heterosexual males. But there are white women who have white privilege. There are white members of the LGBTQ community that have white privilege, it's a spectrum. And white Jews are on that spectrum. So once we get over that hurdle, then we can move more towards how white Jews interact with other Jews of color and with other communities of color that aren't Jewish, which sort of harkens back to James Baldwin's essay actually, which it's titled, Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white, where he has a particular line there where he says um, black people's sort of anti-Semitism towards Jews aren't because they're different and they operate differently from other white people, but because they act the same. And so that sort of needs to be taken into account. They're the same sort of talking points that you'll see in white circles and national circles. You will see similar rhetoric happening in Jewish circles. But then there's a sort of intellectual dishonesty that happens where there's like, oh no, we're both oppressed minorities and so we should be getting along, which sort of is disingenuous to the point or the fact where Jewish interactions with minorities use the same functions and buy into the same systems and apply the same supremacies. And so that creates a, a resentment. Speak, let's, speaking of like Cronheit specifically, for example, uh, a lot of the tension there is that you hear a lot about uh, anti-Semitic attacks on Jews in Cronheit. What you don't hear as much are racist attacks that happen from Jews to the African-American communities. I've experienced them. I've been spit on in kosher pizza parlors growing up. I've been pushed into traffic by other Chabad Jews. I have uh, colleagues who, as teenage girls, were punched in the mouth by grown Chabad adult men. And as they run to their fathers, the attacker runs up and says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize she was Jewish because this is an okay interaction to have between like grown men and teenage girls. But those kind of things don't get amplified. And so it seems like the Caribbean community, the African American community in Crown Heights are always the villains and always the actors. And so it, speaking of Crown Heights specifically, it creates this self-propagating sort of cycle that feeds on itself. Uh, there's, there's racism that happens towards the African American community, then that pre and semitism that happens towards Jewish community, which end bolsters that thought of, of racism towards black and so it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and again one of the reasons why that cycle is able to keep happening is because there's no cog like in between there where Jews of color are that cog where it's like hey 
I'm part of like the Jewish in crowd, but I've experienced this from Jewish community. That's a thing. Or, hey, I'm part of the black community and I've experienced these anti-Semitisms. And so unless you have that cohesion, unless you have, again, all those people in the room, everyone is operating from a false premise of perception. Yeah. Friends, I'm going to take just a few more questions and then we'll open it up for others' questions as well. We have uh, until quarter after, um, quarter after, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, so about uh, 25 more minutes here. Um, well, so first, so firstly, um, um, when have you seen um, uh, an intervention go well? An intervention, let's say there was an, uh, a white Orthodox ally who saw something happening um, and you saw them take a stand. Um, what are some good models you've seen of interventions? Uh, many who feel uh, no one cares, they witness something disturbing. Um, what, are some, what, what are some ways to bring, uh, you know, bring positive responses to that? Um, I have one excellent example of a very good interaction I, I experienced once. Uh, I was at a Hanukkah party, <laughs> and uh, I, I spoke about this in, in, in my Eli talk that I gave, where uh, someone came up to me and said, uh, so are you really Jewish, or are you just, you know, expletiving around? And so then I had words with him later, and I'm saying at the party, like, the person who was in charge of the party happened to be, like, the rabbi of the community, and he happened to overhear as I was telling somebody else. And without the sort of fanfare or, or this sort of uh, performative, you know, para, I, I watched him like dart through the crowd. I saw him corner to the guy and like just sort of tear him out and ring him out with no, you know, look at what I'm doing or bring this person over, everybody watch this. And so those are, that was a very good example of that kind of interaction. But a good intervention, the best intervention, should be the ones that I never see because they're happening even when I'm not in the room. Mm -hmm. And those are the important ones. Not standing up just because I happen to be in earshot or because you can see me in the room. If you're at a table where everyone looks like you, same background, same everything, and somebody says that thing, hey, and calling them out there in those spaces. So those, the best <coughs> one that we never see. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm realizing now in the bio that was given to me did not include um, your most recent book um, on, on, on this particular issue we're discussing. Uh, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that, about um, why you wrote that, what you found in writing that, how the response has been. <laughs> uh, that's actually a funny story because that sort of book and narrative is what sparked this career of writing. Because um, again, I fell into this accidentally. I never intended or wanted to be like this speaker on racial and religious identity and how the intersection manifests in American Judaism or uh, definitely not become a rabbi, <laughs> despite <laughs> my mother's wildest dreams. Um, I just wanted to write screenplays. I wanted to write about dragons and elves and, and fairies and King Arthur and all those, you know, fun things. Uh, but I realized that there weren't a lot of Orthodox screenwriters, there weren't a lot of Black Orthodox screenwriters, so I should probably try to tell that story. And in writing that screenplay, I realized there was far too much that I wanted to cover. The things that I were, was covering were too superficial to really be worth anything. And I realized that there wasn't really a common dialogue to sort of walk people into this world with. And so that's when I started blocking this, and I started writing, started writing and turning into speaking. And then finally, I felt like we were at a place where I could write this story and there's enough out there, enough dialogue, enough research, enough vocabulary for people to like sort of get it. And it's really just the existence of various forms and strains of Jews of color just trying to navigate life, uh, experiencing, uh, anti-Semitism in non-Jewish ethnic spaces, experiencing racism in Jewish spaces, experiencing um, uh, that pushback against Christian hegemony and you being Jewish and a person of color being seen as you being an inauthentic person of color. 
uh, being seen as a person of color in Jewish spaces as something that you just showed up to or something new or, or exotic. Uh, tensions interdenominationally between you know, Orthodox Jews and, and non-Orthodoxy in more liberal spaces and the weird paradox of being, of having to prove how Jewish you are by Jews that then say, well, I don't have to do that, or I, I don't do all that. So it's, it's a weird conundrum, but I thought it was important to see sort of the human aspect inside from that, from inside the eyes of what it feels like to walk through a Jewish neighborhood on Shabbat and say Shabbat Shalom and get, you know, good afternoons back. Or to walk through spaces where you get these looks from people old enough to have gone through the Holocaust and remember what that look felt like, but still give it. And those sort of intricacies. And again, just trying to live life. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one more from me, and then I'll open up the floor for others. Um, are there ways that, that wet hawkish, hawkish Israeli rhetoric in orthodoxy um, intersects with racial insensitivities? Yes, and sometimes it's with the best of intentions. Um, I, I can't name how many interactions I've been in where in pushback to racist sentiments, somebody steps up and says, why are you doing that? You know, we have, you know, it's like to not, you know, harass the gear. It's like, I'm not a gear. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, or those sort of missteps that are still coming from a space of racial insensitivity or ignorance about the diversity of Jewish culture and people. Okay, friends, uh, be sure to unmute yourself if you want to ask something. We have about uh, 15 minutes left. Not all at once. <laughs> Hi, this is Leslie Anderson from Atlanta. And I just had a question regarding kind of microaggressions and how to, sometimes I feel like, sometimes I feel like they are, they're not intentional, right? Like they're just, the, the othering that, um, that you kind of talked about before, I think is so pervasive in our society and almost in human nature that people kind of start to engage in those things and they're not even realizing they're doing them. And I appreciate very much your point about the best interventions are the ones you don't see. But I'm also wondering how to, and I'm thinking about this more structurally um, within my community, how do I create space to um, pay attention to those things and to have those things noticed and potentially um, discussed, right? Like I don't want to use the word confronted. I don't know if I kind of want to go there, but just simply say, look, this is what this is what I see happening, and I want to find a way to to shift or change or discuss that um, in a real way that's not about you know shame or uh, or anything of that nature. Like I feel like too often whites get defensive, right, when it's pointed out, and that's not really the point. The point is more about awareness, and I'm just I struggle with how to have that conversation uh, around awareness, and um, I guess that's so I'm kind of. Uh, hoping you can help me figure that out. Like what, I don't want to make, you know, in terms of being welcoming, how do we know when we're being welcoming versus potentially being patronizing? Like we don't mean to be patronizing. So I, I'll stop talking now because I'm starting to sound like an idiot. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you uh, for the question. I, I think there are several things to keep in mind that might help with that. Uh, firstly, when approaching Jews of color or other different Jews, you might be asking that question for the first time, but it might be the 100th time they've heard it that day. And so there's a sort of weariness of having to answer the same question over and over and over again, particularly if one is just trying to be Jewish in a Jewish space, just like everyone else. Um, and I think we have when it comes to other groups or other people, we sort of have an internal compass of how to be welcoming and, and how to be, uh, I would say just civil, that for some reason gets lost when it comes to Jew of colors. When, like, when you 
see somebody with one arm, you don't immediately ask you, so I'm just curious, but how'd you lose the arm? Like, what do you do? You engage with that person. You, you uh, ensure a relationship with that person, a friendship of, of uh, commonality, a social working relation. And then that story comes out. People are going to tell you their stories when they feel comfortable with you, just like you share your stories once you're comfortable. Uh, I think there's sort of a sense of entitlement that comes in these sort of scenarios that just by dint of having asked a question, you feel your own answer, which that's never true in any other sort of context. Uh, another point to sort of keep in mind is that intent is irrespective of impact. Like you could mean however, you know, oh, you look great in that dress. Have you lost weight? Like they might intentionally be meaning that as a compliment, but for some reason, whatever reason, which, and they're your reasons, so they're valid, that might be offensive to you. Like maybe you've just gone through an illness and so now you've lost weight or you've had a terrible tragedy, so you're not eating. So calling attention to like how good you look now, it's also sort of a backhanded compliment that you didn't look good before. And so in those cases, uh, there's no reason to become defensive, just be, you know, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean that. That's not how I meant it. Now let's move on to like a different subject or a different topic, or how would you, you know, prefer me address this or not address this? And uh, a third piece that I think is relevant in these conversations is that dialogues and concepts have been become highly dichotomized where we've sort of taken the concept of traits and applied it wholesale to something where people sort of think that if someone does this, they're this kind of person. If you said something racially charged, that means you're racist, so that means you're inherently evil. No, that you can be an otherwise good person and have said something racist. And again, there's sort of this polarization, a racist means you're running around in the streets with you know, a torch and a hood on. No, you could be a racist and not be doing that. Like there are these degradations and these nuances that need to be re-explored and reintroduced into the public discourse if we're trying to again move forward. Awesome, thank you. Okay, next question. Hi, I'm Lee Winston. I'm calling from Pittsburgh. Hi. I really appreciate this. This is such an, a unique opportunity to talk about these uh, issues. And um, I was living in uh, Beersheba for the last couple of years and saw different flavors of racism there as well. And it's, it's very, it's everywhere and it's distressing and it's difficult. And um, I think one of the things that I'm taking away is the idea that <laughs> it's gonna be uncomfortable and we have to just find our comfort with that and or embrace the discomfort. Um, there are misunderstandings, whatever. Um, anyway, I just a comment, I think. I don't know that I have a question. Oh, I do have a question. Um, do people ever assume, uh, so people assume within the Jewish community that you're not Jewish. Do people outside of the Jewish community do the same thing? Yes. <laughs> The answer to both would be yes. Yes. Um, actually, a lot of that is one of the reasons why I don't personally identify as uh, Chabad anymore. Mm. Uh, it's not to do with the ideology. I mean, I'm not particularly Meshchis. I'm talking about the other ideologies of Chabad, uh, particularly the Kiruv aspects. Uh, but it's the execution that's inherently flawed. If you have mitzvah tanks, mitzvah tables sitting around and they're asking people, are you Jewish? What rubric 
are you deciding to use when you're asking if people are Jewish? I've met several Jews of color that have walked by Chabad tables just wanting to get more involved and just hoping somebody would ask and never have. I've had Jew of color friends who walk by tables with a white non-Jewish friend and the white non-Jewish friend gets asked if they're Jewish. Wow. Um, I myself was on a train once in the winter. I'm all bundled up. It's a Friday afternoon and a Chabad booker comes through and he's giving out the be Jewish cards, be Jewish cards, and he hands me a B'nai Noach card. So I call him back and I say, why did you give me this card? And he's like, oh, these are, you know, all the Noah kind laws that every non-Jew should like abide by. And I said to him, tell I'm not Jewish just by looking at me. And he didn't have an answer. And I said, you realize if I was somebody who was struggling with their imuna and their faith, right now, this would be the moment that would push me off the derrick. So if you're in the business of interacting with Jewish souls, you might want to rejigger that, that equation a little bit to figure that out. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you. Someone else? Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca. I'm from Baltimore, actually doing this webinar from City Hall. Uh, I am a neighborhood liaison for uh, North and Northwest Baltimore, two areas that are um, famously overlapping of, of Black and Jewish communities in all those different ways. And, um, and so also a part of uh, synagogue and all this stuff, uh, but so I, I'm kind of asking this on a macro level and stuff, as far as community building and uh, healing of past of, of, of past patterns within communities and stuff. Um, what are steps that you suggest, or you know, are things to keep in mind when kind of addressing this on, you know, on that macro community level? I would suggest. And thank you, thank oh. you so much. Well, thank you, thank you for the question. <laughs> I would again suggest getting everyone in the room. All the kinds of Jews and all the kinds of non-Jews. Because again, you're not gonna be able to create that full puzzle picture if pieces are missing. And I would go a step further and look, there are people in your community. All the things you need are going to be in your community. Uh, it's, it's one thing to like fly, like if you flew me out there, I mean, sure, I could tell you about New York. What I'm saying is probably also going to work in Baltimore. But there are likely people that are already in your backyard that have been doing this work and are doing this work. And another, I think, flaw that happens is the overlooking of the people that are in our own backyards, which then goes for to create a different kind of resentment and undoing sort of the process. It's, uh, it's one thing having Again, excuse me, it's me coming in and giving you all these uh, widely, widely mappable sort of strategies. It's something very different. So many communities say, yeah, well, and on Chestnut Street and, and Rogers, there's this, and these are the interactions that happen on like Maine and Maple. And those are the voices that are needed in, this, in that room. Look for those local voices first. They're there. They're going to be there. They're always there. Thank you. Next question. Actually, this is Leslie again, and I just wanted to um, ask about the um, Jews of Color Field Initiative or Field Building Initiative. Um, um, and I think it may be on, I just heard about uh, Alana Kaufman um, was doing that, and we actually had, had some programs here that was sponsored through them through a grant through one of our local um, folks here who actually had a couple of conversations. They're called the conversations, um, courageous conversations is what we call them. And um, we found them very useful. So I don't know if that might be helpful for other people on the line in terms of developing local, utilizing your local resources. There may be some grant money available to help you do that. I would definitely recommend that. I was actually part of that uh, first think tank where that initiative sprung forth. That was like me, Alana Kaufman, Rabbi Zia Rothstein, uh, Yvonne McCoy, a whole host of people out there 
And uh, I would definitely recommend that as a resource if anyone's looking. And um, Ilana Kaufman is gonna be one of the presenters in this webinar series as well. So we hope folks will join for that. I think we have time for one more question. I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, I think that you're amazing. I've been following you on Facebook. I'm actually a part of the same group that you are um, on Facebook for Jews of Color. Um, Sorry. I, I uh, have been seeing your work for a while and I'm so happy that you're a part of this initiative because it means so much to me. I'm working side by side with one of my mentors here with Rabbi Shmuley. It's an honor that um, when we were discussing bringing you on, I was so ecstatic. I have a question for you, and it's something that I've been continuously struggling with, um, which is every single time I'm in a Jewish space, the number one question is the assumption that I'm not Jewish. Um, and the assumption, I could be wearing a kippah, I could be wearing my Star of David, no matter what it is, um, I have to explain to everybody how my Judaism um, comes to play or how am I Jewish. And, and I always have to explain things to somebody. Um, what recommendations would you give to kind of tell people that that's not okay, uh, but not being harsh about it? Because um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that I want to assume the best intentions in people. And, and I know that sometimes um, those questions come from a place of fear and pain. Um, what recommendations do you give? I can't really give more of a recommendation than what's already constantly stated in halacha of not harassing the stranger or of Derek Eretz or of uh, it's the term is fleeing my head now but everyone's built in divine presence uh, in, in divine image it's flying out of my head the term um, what I would say to you though again is to not feel beholden that just because someone asked a question means that you are obligated to answer it any more than any other personal part of your life. That no one's owed that answer just because they're curious. Um, a lot of interesting sort of responses that, oh, but I just, you know, I just find it so inspiring. It's like, well, then go to like a share and be inspired there. Like, I'm just trying to live life. I'm not trying to be this walking wellspring of constant inspiration to everyone that I meet. I just want to show up in Davin, just like you get to, you know. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Rabbi Shays Rishon. This was, uh, this was phenomenal. It was a great uh, kickoff for us um, to go deeper. Thank you to um, all the participants here, very thoughtful questions and for your presence. And uh, please be sure to, uh, con to sign on to the pledge yet if you didn't. Uh, to give us suggestions on more we can be doing, um, and to tap into the upcoming webinars. You can follow the Uri Lutzetic Facebook page where you'll see updates on that if you're not receiving the Uri Lutzetic uh, email uh, list, or if you email us at info uh, at youthcetic.org, uh, we could add you to that list. Um, and uh, we thank you for your partnership, and Rabbi Rishon, uh, wish you so much, continued, uh, uh, so much continued success in your endeavors. Thank you, and I, I'm really looking forward to the success of this particular program here. Thank you, Rabbi, Rabbi Shmuley, for uh, having me on for this wild ride. Call to Chodesh Tov. Excellent.